today I actually want to come back and I'm going to go back to the Latin and Law series. But I want to bring up something because I was asked a question regarding how or when a police officer can shoot. And there is a horrible misconception of what that pretty much entails or the context of that is. What I wanted to do is go over it today and I want to go over the case Tennessee v. Gardner. But first, I'm going to let you watch this video and it's from the TV series, The Rookie. And this is one of the things that I want to illustrate today and I want to make sure everybody has a firm understanding of this. So what watch. circumstance can a firearm be discharged at a moving vehicle? Only if the person in the vehicle is immediately threatening an officer or another person with deadly force using something other than the vehicle. Yeah. Now, basically, you constantly hear me talking about a police officer when they take their oath of office, have a fiduciary obligation to the public. Now, one of the things that is a violation that is used in your federal lawsuit is violation of fiduciary responsibility. And it's USC 29501B. I've also done a couple of podcasts that spoke about the police officers having responsibility when you are in their custody. And again, that's because of their fiduciary responsibility or their fiduciary duty. When we're talking about police shootings and when is it okay for a police officer to discharge his weapon? Now you constantly hear me talk about they have a primary duty of care, which is why they have six to seven non-lethal weapons on them or available to them at all times because their number one priority is preservation of life. What happens is we have this thing called the human element. And even Tennessee v. Gardner, which is Tennessee v. Gardner, 471 U.S. 1, 1985. A police officer may not seize an unarmed, non-dangerous suspect by shooting him dead. However, where the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect does possess a threat of serious physical harm either to the officer or to others it is not constitutionally unreasonable to prevent the escape by using deadly force now the keys to this are unarmed non-dangerous here's where the application of the actual decision goes into play this cannot shoot or discharge their weapon at someone unless they are using something other than the vehicle as a weapon there's a video that i'm going to play right here or somewhere around me which is going to show or display one of the instances i was having a conversation about which brought up this discussion it's the fact that many people believe that the police officer placing himself in harm's way by jumping onto the vehicle authorized him to use deadly force during a traffic citation to which the, the actual officer in charge or the one that had made the initial stop had already had in control. I'll say that one more time. The officer that made the initial stop had this display under control everybody was relaxed everybody had an understanding except her partner her partner then chose to escalate the situation to which the suspect began to flee the officer instead of allowing the suspect to flee for a traffic violation he jumped onto the vehicle claimed he was in fear for him li his life, 
by placing himself in danger and then discharged his weapon when the passenger nor the driver had a weapon. Because again, police officers can use their weapon or a deadly force if there is something other than the vehicle being used as a weapon and someone else's life is in danger. These are the things that are often misconstrued. Now, but the one thing that caught my attention whenever I was going through this is the fact that Tennessee v. Gardner, to me, a clear cut and dry statute. Can't use deadly force unless the person has a weapon and endangering others. Got it. Why are this why is this not a criminal statute? Because again, this goes to civil lawsuits, which goes into wrongful death lawsuits, which makes Tennessee versus Gardner not a criminal citation or criminal decision, but a civil one. Why? Because the police officers have a fiduciary duty or a fiduciary obligation to the public. Now, when you're looking at wrongful death, it is also codified. It's 28 USC 1346 WD, wrongful death. If you've already filed it in state court, because in, a, in many cases you can file them in state court, it is known for a removal, or you can remove it to federal court via 28 USC 1446 WD. Now, why are these things codified? Well, one of the things that I always talk about, and it 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 kind of gets gets to me a little bit because whenever I say this, it sounds crazy. I know it does. But the one thing that we must do in order to correct this behavior, because we know nobody else is, we must first begin to hold them accountable in federal court. We know in state court, it is about revenue generation. Federal court, they have to go by law. Now, if these things are not true, why are they codified in federal law? Why was the police officer held by the feds for oath violation? Why is an oath violation in the federal law? Why is it codified? Now, if these things are to be done, one of the people that I, I looked up yesterday, her parents, after her death, filed against four police officers. Now, I'm going to go back to one of my early videos, probably at least a year old now, where I spoke about holding the supervisors liable for the actions of their subordinates. In this case, two of the officers that killed this young woman were not held responsible because, one, their involvement did not come from or did not cause her death. They were still held liable in other aspects. Say that one more time. They were not found guilty in the wrongful death because their actions did not directly affect the death of this young woman. However, they were held liable in other aspects because they are the supervisors of the two officers that were responsible for taking the life of this young woman. We are responsible for holding them accountable. We have to make a determine to make sure we are ready to go to court. We are ready to fight back. And when we're fighting back, we're doing it the right way because it's so often that people contact me about help. And I literally have a video that says, do this first. And it amazes me the amount of people that call me that say they watched that video and have not done that first. I give you all these things. I make all these repetitious statements. I constantly talk about this simply because I'm giving you something. I'm making it easy for you to understand. And I'm also know, making it easy. So whenever you're preparing to fight 
because that's exactly what this is. You are equipped to not only fight and defend, but to actually win. Now, the more I go on, the more I give you, and the more in depth I get. I'm going to do a couple of lives. I know I say that a lot, but at the end of the day, the reason I don't do lives is because there is something I feel I'm going to leave out or something that I'm going to miss. And for the most part, this is the best way I know how or I feel I can give you what you need to be successful. This is what I feel you can use or those that have a loved one that was killed by police officers, especially places like Chicago, which I just did a podcast on and even showed you the behind the scenes footage of that, where 97 people have been killed by police officers and Eddie T. Johnson or the mayor, they're not looking to hold the police officers responsible. If they're not going to do it, you have to do it. Their families have to do it. They have to be encouraged to do it because we have to have this behavior stopped. And remember, all the clocks start ticking at the time someone is pronounced dead. And generally, if it's not done within two years, you lose the ability to fight. So keep that in mind. It's codified in federal law. They have a duty. This is one of the ways that you hold them responsible for wrongful death. And Tennessee versus Gardner is not a criminal Supreme Court decision. It is a civil Supreme Court decision. Police officers cannot discharge their weapon for on a fleeing suspect if that suspect has not illustrated that they have or access to or in use of something other than the vehicle. And the police have to have probable cause of that. So keep that in mind. I'm still coming. I'll get back on topic. Videos will be coming. I'm back in service. Talk to you guys soon.